uh, I suggest we go uh, further than 80 years uh, back. I suggest we go 200 years back. And for the last 200 years, people are trying to solve very simple set of equations. Everybody knows these equations. And uh, to make that even simpler, uh, uh, you will have to solve it in a limit of when viscosity uh, tends to zero at fixed energy dissipation. So in fact, that's universal equation. It's the limit of this equation when viscosity goes to zero. And everybody knows that that's not a smooth limit uh, simply because viscosity enters in front of the highest derivative in this equation. So we suspect it's not a trivial limit. Indeed, that's turbulence. Uh, uh, we know what happens in the turbulence limit, but we don't know how to explain this and how to describe it quantitatively. So that will be the purpose of my talk. Uh, instead of unique solution, depending smoothly on initial da data or some unique fixed point, we have statistical distribution of artistic structures with some universal properties. So to say we have, instead of fixed point, we have a fixed manifold. And we have to explain how we get there and what is the distribution over this manifold. We don't even know the physical origin of this distribution, not to mention its complexity and its multifractal properties, far more complex than conformal field theory. Conformal field theory is inapplicable here simply because of non-local effects. Conservation law for velocity and vorticity uh, uh, means that uh, that would require conformal dimension uh, equal to in three dimensions, uh, both for velocity and vorticity, which is its curl, so it's mathematically impossible and wrong experimentally. So there is no conformal field theory basically because of inc incompressibility. Now, if we take a fresh look at the expression for energy dissipation, let me show you that expression here. New times integral of omega squared. Uh, if you look at this expression, uh, take a fresh look, then you will immediately understand, and that could have been done 200 years ago, that vorticity should be singular in some regions of space to compensate for the infinitesimal viscosity in front. So uh, we have to look for singular solutions. Such singularities are known to exist, in particular in liquid helium, where the viscosity is zero. These are vortex lines and vortex sheets. Uh, vortex lines have infinite velocity, uh, which is too much uh, here, but vortex sheets uh, have finite velocity, just discontinuous. There is a tangent discontinuity, which was mentioned in the previous talk. One can imagine the smeared velocity discontinuity creating large vorticity such that its square would compensate for the viscosity in front. And as we shall shortly see, that's exactly what happens, but there are very interesting details to work out. To give an idea how the vortex sheet explains the dissipation, let's consider a local vicinity of some point x, y, zero, a local tangent plane or the vortex sheet and look for the balance of most singular terms in the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. So this is the uh, Euler term, which we, where we leave only z derivative with respect to normal direction where it is large. So it's vz dz of velocity should be equal to uh, uh, new times dz squared of velocity. Now, I neglect pressure. I actually have a more comprehensive analysis, including pressure. It's rather easy to show that pressure uh, doesn't contribute to this balance. And uh, what we uh, find immediately is that for this equation to have a solution which decreases in both directions, velocity vz should go to zero proportionally to z, after which this equation could be immediately solved. Solution is uh, the Gaussian for the vorticity and the error function for velocity. Error function uh, of uh, some z divided by some width h, and that width should go to zero to compensate uh, for uh, viscosity. Uh, in the limit of vanishing h, uh, error function becomes discontinuity, so that becomes the Euler uh, solution with tangent discontinuity. But at finite viscosity, it is rapidly varying, and that have a potential of uh, compensating the viscosity in front of entropy. Indeed, that's what happens. If we take the entropy, it will involve the square of the Gaussian. Square of the Gaussian is also the Gaussian, but there is extra coefficient in front. 
as a result, you will have ratio of nu over h. So nu times omega squared is reduced to square of discontinuity times a uh, ratio of viscosity to h and the Gaussian. So if we go now to the limit of h going to zero, Gaussian becomes delta function, and we get a very simple result. We get this lambda, this coefficient, times integral square of velocity discontinuity. So that is viscosity anomaly. That's a forgotten term in the Euler equation. That's what remains from the viscosity in the limit of uh, vanishing, from the viscous term in the Navier-Stokes in the limit of uh, zero viscosity. Very simple, very precise, and then we could develop very precise consequence of, of that forgotten term in Euler equation. Sorry to interrupt, but what was t in v sub t? Let's say it again. I don't hear you, say it again. In all your formulas, what is t in v sub t? What do you mean by v sub t? Is t the tangent direction along the yes, line? Yes, tangent to the plane, yes. That's tangential. Yeah, uh, you see, the discontinuity of velocity is only tangent discontinuity. The normal velocity at the uh, um, place where the vertices is infinite have to be constant or vanish. It should be continuous across the, uh, the surface yeah, for discontinuity. So T means uh, uh, tangent, tangent. So, uh, so that was the idea. Let's see how that forgotten term uh, actually changes the uh, theory of turbulence. Uh, let's describe the theory of vortex sheets. Um, there's quite a beautiful theory of vortex sheets, uh, of which um, basically are infinitesimally thin sheets moving in its own velocity. Uh, the following ansatz describes vortex sheet vorticity. So vorticity is integral of three-dimensional delta function uh, times uh, two-dimensional form. Uh, which is uh, grad uh, gamma times grad x. So this, af after you integrate that, you, of course, you'll get delta function of normal direction. And the coefficient in front will be a um, gradient of uh, gamma in the tangent direction. So this, uh, and that identically satisfies the incompressibility. So divergence of that is zero for arbitrary gamma. It's easy to see from this formula. And um, the dynamics uh, is well known. That was published, I published that paper in 87 and then studied numerically in Princeton here in 88 and 89. Uh, uh, this is well known uh, Lagrange dynamics. Gamma is conserved and uh, time derivative of X of the surface equals to velocity and velocity is understood as principal value um, of this integral. Uh, it is so-called Biot-Savart integral. It's um, like a uh, magnetic field with vector potential psi. Uh, it is uh, this integral which has discontinuity of velocity and uh, uh, the surface moves with the velocity given by the mean value, principal value. So uh, this function gamma which we introduced is equivalent to integral of uh, velocity discontinuity over the path on the surface. And this definition doesn't depend on the path because there is norm, no normal flux um, mm, through the surface. At every side of the surface, velocity is purely potential. It's actually gradient. Uh, and integral gradient is just unique function. So you may say that uh, mm, this, if you represent velocity as a gradient of some potential on two sides of the surface, then uh, this gamma is simply the discontinuity of that potential. So that's what I'm saying here. The line integral doesn't depend on the path. And um, it was found uh, that uh, the Euler equation, Lagrange version of Euler equation, corresponds to very simple two-dimensional action. Uh, there is a two-dimensional field X depending of two internal coordinates on the surface. So X is a equation of the surface. And Hamiltonian, which is an original variable, just integral of v squared, in terms of this uh, gamma and uh, uh, x is this double integral. It's like Coulomb interaction, singular uh, interaction, but of course, integral converges. 
So what is interesting here is this, um, this term in the action. It is gamma times dv. And dv is this thing, which is just variation of the little volume uh, swept by the element of the surface. That's ordinary action for the uh, string, I would say, uh, in a sense. Uh, uh, the the um, action involves uh, uh, the volume swept by the surface in its movement times gamma. And this gamma serves as a conserved momentum associated with the coordinate x. And if you find a variation of this action, you will find two things. You will find that time derivative of x, if you vary that with respect to x, you'll find that time derivative of x is related to v, velocity, which is uh, was defined above. And then you will find out that variation of gamma will be identically zero, um, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, the equation of motion for x is satisfied. In other words, gamma is conserved because this is a degenerate system. It has identically conserved momentum associated with coordinate x. So that's a very beautiful and simple symmetric two-dimensional system. And that describes the dynamics of the vortex sheet. Now, um, here is what happens with this um, conformal, oh, I'm sorry, not conformal, not yet conformal, with the viscosity anomaly. Uh, Oh, I want to say that there's also conserved momentum, which is important. It's integral of velocity, which is equivalent to integral of gamma over vector element of the surface. Let's assume the surface is closed surface, then it is um, integral of gamma over the surface. Now, uh, if you find particular gamma, which minimizes Hamiltonian at fixed coordinate, then suddenly we find that the stationary solution of lagrange euler equation. Usually gamma is considered as a conserved quantity which is just carried from initial boundary con initial conditions, but when you could find the question, what would be, uh, what will happen if we minimize Hamiltonian with respect to gamma and find that optimal gamma minimizing Hamiltonian? The answer is uh, with that gamma, we will have stationary solution of the Euler equation. And uh, that seems a bit strange because uh, uh, there's only one variable gamma and three variable x. But turns out when you vary uh, Hamiltonian with respect to gamma, you will just get the tangent component of the uh, equation of motion. But if you uh, set to zero the tangent velocity, I mean, I'm sorry, normal velocity, because variation of gamma is uh, conjugate to normal velocity. If you if you find, uh, if you set normal velocity to zero, the tangential velocity of the surface is equivalent to reparameterization. Uh, and because of parametric invariance of this equ equation, it will be satisfied automatically. And that rather abstract statement can be proven by direct solutions which we found and I will present later. So indeed, uh, if you find that particular gamma, which minimizes the mm, Hamiltonian of the fluid, uh, then uh, you'll you will solve uh, stationary Lagrange Euler equation. But that's not our goal. Our goal here is to find what happens uh, in the turbulent region, not uh, on the stationary solutions, because of course they are unstable. In case of the handle on the surface, gamma acquires extra term. Um, if, if you go around the surface, then gamma is not constant, but rather takes extra term, which is uh, integral of velocity discontinuity around the handle. And um, uh, uh, that uh, discontinuity, in fact, is related to the flux. You see, uh, vorticity is concentrated in an infinitesimally small layer. It's, uh, uh, say, suppose we have a vortex tube, closed uh, torus. Uh, there is no normal vorticity. All vorticity goes in tangential direction. So if we consider the circle, uh, the flux through the red disk, that reduces to the flux only through the skin of the torus. And after simple calculation, you find out such flux is indeed uh, the integral of uh, velocity discontinuity over the uh, uh, cycle of the torus. And of course, you could use another cycle. You will get another velocity uh, discontinuity through a different cycle of the torus. So, 
In effect, we have topological theory because uh, the, there is no normal vorticity. Uh, all these circulations really uh, does not depend on shape of the loop. They only uh, depend on which uh, uh, which uh, uh, handle of the surface they um, in, uh, go around and circle. Now, uh, our Hamiltonian is nonlinear and non-local. It can be localized by introducing auxiliary uh, three-dimensional vector field. If you do that, you'll find out that this integral, three-dimensional scalar, I mean, vector field uh, with zero mass, plus uh, this term related to gamma, uh, if you integrate psi out, you'll get the previous Hamiltonian. Uh, and in this form, it's clear that gamma is not a dynamical field. If you vary that, you will get, uh, you'll find out that the field should satisfy Laplace equation, and gamma actually is a Lagrange multiplier for the boundary conditions. Uh, it's Neumann boundary condition on the surface of the vortex discontinuity. Remember, we have potential uh, uh, flow outside the uh, vortex sheet, so of course it's potential, and um, all we really need to do is to find uh, uh, match the, uh, uh, the the normal velocity at the surface. And indeed, that's the easiest way to solve uh, these uh, stationary equations. Now, uh, we want to add actually uh, the term, uh, this term, the term with total momentum. We want to add it because we want to have a constant random force. This F will later become random force. We want to shake the system and the energy corresponding to adding constant random force is just force times momentum. It's a, power generated by, uh, by the force. So we want to add that term uh, with Lagrange multiplier to the Hamiltonian to, to, to have uh, the energy uh, pumping, which would compensate for the energy dissipation, which we are now going to consider. So uh, let's go further. Yes, viscosity anomaly. So viscosity anomaly, is a remarkable thing. If you compute that viscosity anomaly, it is square of delta uh, uh, discontinuity of velocity in terms of gamma, it's gradient gamma squared. Bingo. This uh, auxiliary field suddenly became dynamical. It got the potential two dimensional uh, kinetic energy. Now we have um, massless vector field psi interacting with massless uh, field on the surface. This is a massless, uh, this, that is in fact very important thing in my observation. It is the uh, massless mode, soft mode of the, of the theory on the surface. There's invariance with respect to translation of gamma, which is supporting uh, uh, the fact that there will be no mass for this gamma field, three-dimensional field without mass. And that is in my view, the whole origin of all these critical phenomena, including the multi-scaling. Let me, and proceed. Uh, uh, there is also some term which we want to add for the closed surface because uh, we don't want to um, surface to go kind of go to infinity unstoppable. Uh, it has to have a conserved volume. Uh, the volume inside the surface, the vortex surface is conserved because nothing leaks through the surface. If there is a constant velo normal velocity, it just moves the whole object and uh, integral flow through the surface, a vortex surface equal to zero. So this volume is conserved. So we could add Lagrange multiplier for a conservation. Now we uh, could actually find this steady state when all dissipated energy is compensated by the power generated by external random forces. And uh, you could solve these equations. You take this, uh, uh, force uh, with some yet unknown uh, uh, variance, sigma, and solve above equations. Uh, the equations looks quite complex in general, but if you consider gamma, which is, um, say, you consider a sphere, you consider gamma, which is linear on a sphere, then there will be no Laplacian. Everything else will be solved in a very trivial way. And the result is, uh, the following solution, 
Oh, I'm not yet ready to describe the solution. Before I describe the solution, I want to uh, just uh, estimate the various terms. Uh, it turns out we want to consider the limit when viscosity goes to zero, but the, uh, uh, but the energy dissipation stays finite. So how that will happen? Well, uh, remember, we have this parameter lambda in front of kinetic energy, which is proportional to ratio of viscosity over H. We have to find how H should depend on viscosity. So this lambda is proportional to nu over H. On the other hand, uh, the term in Navier's Stokes equation uh, is nu over H squared. So there is a different combination. Nu over H is the thing which enters in the um, dissipation and nu over H squared is the thing which enters in Navier's Stokes equation. Now we have to compare these terms. So let's rescale all the fields. Uh, let's scale lambda out of them so that kinetic energy will be dimensionless and then we'll find out that nu over h squared, which is ratio of, uh, which is uh, the term, uh, the term uh, in Navier-Stokes equation, nu over h squared, it should be proportional to velocity, which is lambda minus one half. So if you substitute lambda as nu over h and put everything together, you'll find a remarkably simple solution that h should go to zero as nu to the three fifths Lambda should go to zero as nu to the two fifths, and so will sigma. And that, if you think about that, is extremely interesting observation. Vanishing H uh, means that water sheets dominate extreme turbulence. That means that in a limit of zero viscosity at fixed energy um, dissipation, the water sheet becomes infinitesimally uh, thin, which justifies our approximation and our um, we use. Uh, actually the Euler equation because uh, uh, we don't need uh, to, to study the structure of the sheet, it becomes infinitesimally uh, thin. So vanishing H means that water sheets dominate extreme turbulence because dissipation could only enter through these structures in at vanishing H. Now vanishing sigma means the turbulence arises at vanishing external force, that is spontaneously. That's another extremely interesting point. We have something like critical phenomena. We have infinitesimally small force, and you get finite energy dissipation, finite uh, everything, and that is related to the fact that there are singular uh, solutions of the Euler equations, which enhance this uh, singular force, which infinitesimal force. Now, growing gamma, that goes to negative power of viscosity, means that fluctuations around classical solutions are small. In other words, we have perturbative situation. And that is very familiar for field theories. Uh, if you consider original field theory of fluctuating velocity, it is, it is a very strong coupling regime. It's when fluctuations of velocity become large because perturbation theory in original field theory of, of velocity goes in inverse powers of viscosity. Now this fluctuations, uh, this uh, perturbation theory in terms of this uh, random vortex surfaces, which we'll consider soon, will go in positive power of velocity. So the strong coupling of original theory of fluctuating velocity field corresponds to weak coupling of this uh, effective string theory, which we're going to consider now. And um, Colvin Helmholtz instability implies that this mechanical system will not stay in any particular stationary state, but will cover the whole phase space gamma x with some invariant measure. And because there's always temperature, you don't need to make a guess. This, of course, is the Gibbs distribution. And now you say, aha, Gibbs distribution has nothing to do with that. We tried that. It is not uh, uh, really important, except what uh, we just heard <laughs> from Greg. Uh, but in case of vortex sheets, it's, it's very much more so. It turns out that vortex sheets at arbitrary temperature are uh, uh, enhanced, fluctuations are enhanced, and you get the, because you have two dimensional. Uh, zero modes. You have two-dimensional massless modes, and those massless modes uh, have critical phenomena at arbitrary temperature, as is well known as an example of the XY model and other uh, Galston modes uh, in two-dimensional theories. So uh, here is the partition function which we derive uh, from these arguments. So it is integral over phase space, which is d gamma dv, 
you have to integrate over d gamma and transverse coordinates of the surface. And effective Hamiltonian has uh, four terms. This is just this kinetic term, which is uh, integral of d squared uh, in proper normalization of gamma. And, uh, but it's integral of d squared expressed as we wrote it before in terms of uh, gamma and x. It's a quadratic functional of gamma, but non-local. There is a kernel one over x minus x prime. This is the, um, this is the Lagrange multiplier term fixing the energy pumping, that's momentum. And this is uh, the viscosity anomaly, which provides kinetic energy for the field gamma. And that's the term fixing the volume inside the surface. Now, these are thermodynamic variables. So what you really need to do, you need to compute this um, path integral. But the good news is that your effective temperature is very small because lambda goes to zero. Once we scaled all the variables and all these Lagrange multipliers, lambda just renormalize the temperature. So what we get is effective temperature, uh, which goes to zero as viscosity to the two fifths. Now there is a remarkable uh, coincidence. Mm, as I learned literally today from, <laughs> from Nigel Goldenfeld that he was studying uh, some phenomenological model, which he guessed out of physics intuition, which describes turbulence as a fluctuation of water sheet. Uh, and he assumed that there were soft modes related to the normal motion. In my case, it's not normal motion, it's this gamma. But anyway, he assumed that. And he found that some experiments uh, actually fit uh, that uh, model of water sheets with soft modes. Uh, it's become similar to XY model of phase transitions. And uh, when you compare uh, the data for turbulence, you see that effective temperature um, in, in that model should go as uh, Reynolds number to one third, minus one third. And that's exactly what follows from our theory. If you take uh, Reynolds number, which is gamma over nu, it goes like nu to the minus six fifths. So uh, my, our temperature goes to zero is new to the two fifths, which is Reynolds number to the minus one third. So that's a remarkable coincidence. Uh, one third is a, is a, it's not a number which uh, Goldenfeld derived. In his model, it was like one quarter, but uh, experimentally, according to his paper, experimentally, the best fit is one third. So in that sense, there is a, an agreement now. Mm. The soft, in his model, the soft model was the normal shift of the surface. In our case, it's related to viscosity anomaly. Empirically, the effective temperature was fitted to a power law like we have with the same index one third. Now uh, let's uh, present the solution. So that's a formal vacuum. At, at zero temperature, there is a classical solution which solves these classical equations with dissipation. And uh, it equation uh, for a sphere for a one closed surface equation are solved with a very simple solution. That's exactly the solution. It satisfies the scaling laws, which I described above. A gamma is linear function of coordinate on a sphere. Its Laplacian is zero. And uh, all the other thermodynamical relations are satisfied. And velocity has the following form. Inside the sphere, it is just constant. And outside, it is uh, basically one of our R cube. It's like dipole solution of Laplace equation. So it's obviously a solution of Laplace equation inside and outside. And if you uh, check uh, these two solutions, you'll find that normal velocity, in fact, uh, uh, matches here. Normal velocity matches. And uh, tangent velocity has this continuity corresponding to this value of gamma. And uh, indeed, if you compare uh, the required uh, variance of the force, you'll find that indeed it's proportional to uh, epsilon times lambda. And lambda, as we know, is uh, viscosity to the positive power, two fifths. So that's solution of these equations. That's kind of ground state. But of course, because we have soft modes, uh, that's not what we really uh, need. We need to see how fluctuations around this ground state would affect uh, the physics. And um, here's what happens. Uh, 
the correlation functions of product of vorticities. Uh, remember, vorticity was integral of this form times delta three dimensional delta function. Now, if we substitute this gamma for a classical solution, it becomes something like a vertex operator of the string theory. It will be integral over surface uh, with delta function, with some vertex operator, which in fact, uh, for the ground state to be computed, it's a vector product of force uh, and times sigma. Uh, sigma is normal vector to its cube. So we have a correlation function, which is average of product of some number of vertex operators. And uh, mm, geometrically, it's this sphere with some bumps. And that is has to be related with uh, to this uh, mm, multi-correlations, which was called uh, multifractal or uh, non-trivial scaling law. So indeed, as we shall see now, because of those soft modes, we're going to have non-trivial scaling laws for this correlation function. Uh, so there are, so the massless modes really contribute here. So there is ordinary local kinetic energy term viscosity anomaly, plus there is a non-local term. And I don't know yet how to compute uh, the, integrate out both of these terms and compute the resulting determinant. Uh, but if you, for simplicity, just cross this nonlinear term and see what happens just from the first term. Uh, it's not a solution. I just have, want to give an idea of what's happening. What's happening is that you will have a uh, one dimensional uh, string, which is critical string at d equal one. You will have one dimensional field gamma on the surface uh, and uh, uh, coordinates of the surface are not massless. They, uh, uh, they, there is explicit mass term generated, as, as, for example, from the volume term. Uh, uh, constant variation uh, 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 will mm, uh, you know, reduce, produce terms. So variation of surface are not massless, but variation of gamma is because there's the symmetry protecting zero mass. You can translate gamma by constant. So you have one dimensional field and when you mm, integrate it out, you find out that there is one more, uh, sorry jump too far, sorry. There is one more forgotten term. When you integrate this massless field, I don't know how I jumped so far. Yes, almost there. So when you integrate out this um, uh, massless field, you'll find out that there is one more field which you should take into account, namely the Liouville field. The surface uh, always have this internal metric uh, fluctuating. And if you integrate out this uh, one dimensional uh, field, I mean, two-dimensional field, uh, one component two-dimensional field, which corresponds to one-dimensional string. You'll find out there is conformal anomaly, which leads to effective term in the, in the Lagrangian of this form. And um, those of you who work in string theory, of course, know what I'm talking about. Uh, those of you who are working in turbulence have never maybe heard about this Liouville field, but that exists. If you have the fluctuating surface, one of the degrees of freedom is this internal metric on the surface, which corresponds to all these uh, motions along the surface, which change the area, but don't change the shape of the surface. So these uh, motions are represented by so-called Liouville field, which was computed, computed first by my old friend, Sasha Polikov, in the context of the string theory. So this is now effective Lagrangian. And then we get uh, a correlation function of product of artists will be uh, proportional to this uh, cut off or scale distances times some quadratic expression of number of terms. It will be an alpha times an alpha plus Q. Now, uh, if, if you compare that uh, with a prediction for vorticity based on so-called uh, multi 
fractal scaling laws, you'll find this delta of n is related to n minus z of n. There is this z of n, which is introduced in the context of velocities, but vorticity is a uh, derivative of velocity. Uh, actually, it's curl of velocity. So there will be one um, delta of n will be uh, have extra term n. So once you do that, uh, you'll find that uh, you could uh, now compare this prediction for zeta of n uh, with experiment. And you find out that you could find such values of q and alpha, which reasonably well agree with experiment. Uh, at larger value of n, they wouldn't agree with experiment because this curve will uh, turn and um, become negative, which is not happening with experiment. But this approximation is only valid uh, at, at the low moments, which are far away from the settled point. Uh, in the approximation of large moments where there is completely different theory, uh, which I don't have time to discuss now, but which was slightly mentioned in the talk of Srini. If you have WKB approximation of large uh, uh, velocity, large circulations at large, uh, large moments, which is tails of distribution. So the large moments which correspond to tails of uh, vorticity distribution, they are described by different theory. This theory is only theory for small moment. So uh, d equal one uh, is exactly solvable model. Uh, but we don't really, uh, if you literally take that as a model, you will see that it's almost good, but not quite. Because indeed, at d equal one, these expressions for q and alpha are finite, but they don't match experiment. They are different from what you have experimentally. If you would only try to make this exact relation delta for n equals three equals two, which is Kolmogorov uh, scaling for third moment, uh, that would correspond to weird value of dimension equal four fifth. I don't know what that means. How come? that theory with non-local term suddenly correspond to the uh, fractional value of uh, D, I don't know. So that's an open question. I don't know the answer to that. I know there are soft degrees of freedom, but the interaction is more complex than just in the uh, critical string theory. Now, I still do I still have time? I need 10 more minutes. Hello? Uh, sure. You can have 10 more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there is a different aspect of this work. Uh, in addition to these rather trivial vortex sheets where all vorticity is hidden inside the sheet and there is no normal vorticity, there are a different kind of vortex sheets. And those vortex sheets, in fact, were found in my previous work uh, before I found these simple ones. And these vortex sheets, uh, uh, are, uh, do have some normal vorticity. And they are topologically non-trivial. They, in terms of, they can be described in terms of so-called Klebsch variables. Klebsch variables parameterize vorticity as some constant z times uh, this expression, which is a very well-known current. It's identically conserved current um, uh, in any dimensional space. Uh, and uh, uh, that is the so-called Klebsch parameterization of uh, vorticity in terms of unit vector. And the beauty of that is that uh, Poisson brackets for this S in the um, Euler dynamics are just the same as uh, the Poisson brackets for angular momentum, like a uh, rotator. So uh, what we found is that there is a vortex sheet indeed. And that vortex sheet corresponds to one of these uh, components uh, being continuous, but other components making odd number of uh, rotation over angle pi. So it makes some number of rotation and ends up in opposite direction. Uh, and uh, that is the solution which we described and we compare that and that's a solution which Srini mentioned, which leads to this exponential uh, behavior of probability distribution. Now, uh, we discussed this with Grigory Volovic, who is one of the ex good best experts in the uh, liquid helium 
And he said that, and we concluded after this discussion, that my solution is topologically equivalent to so-called KLS domain wall bounded by Alice string, initially suggested for early universe. Those stable topological defects were indeed, were instead observed in real experiments in liquid helium, which is not so surprising from my point of view, because liquid helium is example of the fluid with zero viscosity. So indeed, there are these domain walls, these uh, topologically and trivial uh, vortex sheets. And uh, uh, vortex sheets look like that. It is a disk bounded by some loop. In terms of clutch variables, uh, the disk is a domain wall such that normal component S3 stays continuous, but tangent components may rotate odd number of times by P, by pi. So uh, in my paper, I made it, got it wrong. I thought it makes even number of rotations, but only odd number is topologically stable, as now I understand. So the disk is like two-dimensional version of a branch cut in a complex plane between two singularities, plus minus A. And these singularities uh, correspond to this boundary of the disk, which is this spring. So um, tangent vorticity uh, in this solution uh, has delta function, and then it is uh, equal to some curl of some um, two-dimensional curl of some functions, which exactly correspond to our vortex sheet with gamma related to the third component of this vector. So this uh, tangent discontinuity is exactly the same as in our previous model with certain gamma. However, uh, there is also the normal discontinuity, which doesn't have a delta function, which is finite. And um, this normal discontinuity is uh, related to derivative of gamma with respect to uh, rho. If you go to, it's easiest to do in polar coordinates. It is related to derivative. So we have both components. You have normal uh, component, which is finite, but it's related to the same gamma, which is determined by the tangent component, which has the uh, singular uh, vorticity. And once you do all this math, uh, so how th that's how this uh, domain wall looks. So that's a green disk bounded by the black curve and the red path around this black curve uh, is the path where this component of the vector changes the sign. And this disk is necessary topologically, otherwise you would have non-unique vector. Now, as it happens on two sides of the domain wall, there, this uh, tangent components of S are, have different directions, opposite directions. So uh, here is an example of the field with this topology. That's a parameterization of unit vector, stereographic mapping. And so we have extra phase factor, which leads to uh, when a cross domain wall go from z equal uh, minus a to z equal h, you'll get this factor which changes sign. Um, so that's the model of the vector s uh, in the vicinity of this domain wall. Now, we could compute the circulation around the loop, the edge of the wall. And because vorticity is derivative of the um, gamma, this integral over surface reduces to integral over the boundary of this of R gamma density, gamma of R, gamma at the edge minus gamma at the middle. And um, Actually, gamma at the middle at rho equals zero must be zero. Otherwise, uh, vorticity will have singularity in the uh, origin, which we don't want. Um, once we now do this thermodynamics, now we'll find out that in presence of the in presence of the uh, thermostat, there is a thermostat of other vorticity structures, and we just single out one structure, which is this uh, domain wall with the loop, we find out that in that case, uh, our energy will be proportional to the some thermostat term plus term which is related to this disk. 
and the same with dissipation. And Z is that factor because that's a common, um, common factor, kinematical factor in vorticity. So the important thing is that uh, every linear expression in terms of velocity is proportional to Z and every quadratic expression is proportional to Z squared. So that's why I wrote these equations like that. Now, if you find uh, the ratio, you'll find that uh, Z, uh, I skip all these calculations as a matter. So Z will be, will become a small force because we're interested in force going to zero. It will be something, one constant plus another constant times some quadratic expression in terms of force with some matrix B depending on geometry. And once you do that, you'll find that uh, circulation, the low circulation also is um, proportional to the Z. So it will also be some quadratic expression in terms of uh, the random force. And the random force is Gaussian. Now, if we have a circulation, which is quadratic, quadratic form made of the Gaussian variable, then you could compute the Wilson loop. Uh, the Wilson loop uh, will be just exponential of I gamma times circulation. You integrate over Gaussian random force and you get the term which is three-dimensional determinant because you have uh, you know, uh, symmetric Gaussian distribution plus there is exponential, there is quadratic term and exponential because of this. So you get this weird expression, uh, which has uh, singularities on the imaginary axis, which means that uh, this thing uh, decays exponentially. If you go to the, if you do the Fourier transform and found probability distribution, you'll find that this thing, because of this complex singularities of the square root of determinant, uh, you will find uh, the nearest singularity. You will have exponential decay and pre-exponential factor because of the, mm, because it's a three-dimensional integral and only one square root. So there'll be, if you integrate near that complex, uh, uh, complex uh, branch point, you will get extra factor because of that integration, one over square root of gamma. And that's exactly what um, Srini measured. That's my uh, fit of the, uh, his curve. Same data, just took his data. So the red data, red points is uh, data from the work of Srini and Kartik Ayer. And the blue line is this uh, fit uh, by the exponential plus times pre-exponential. And we see that even pre-exponential fact fits if, because this, if you look closer, you'll see that this curve is not really straight line. It, it's slightly curved up in the beginning and that fits the data. So we have remarkable uh, uh, fit. It's just one parameter fit of large number of data over uh, what, six decades of the de de decay. So that's very strong that's a very strong argument that these topological defects are present there, that the vorticity is coherent. That's why we get not Gaussian, but exponential distribution. And uh, that theory more or less explains that. Now, I, uh, I have some other things which I would only uh, show if you ask me a certain question. If you don't show, uh, ask me a certain question, I will just leave that uh, aside. So basically that is the end of my talk. Sasha, thank you. Um, uh, Sasha, uh, I think if you uh, said in 10 sentences, the main message of your uh, talk, um, aside from this graph that is in front of us, it would be very helpful. Okay. Here is, thank uh, you, thank you for that question, Srini. Your true friend. <laughs> Not only you inspire that work, but you also help me explain that. I appreciate it. Look, the most important message is that there are hidden degrees of freedom in uh, vortex sheets because of this viscosity anomaly, which was overlooked for 200 years, which could have been derived just from the Navier-Stokes equation. Because of this viscosity anomaly, there is a kinetic energy term for something which was considered to be a non-dynamic variable, this gamma, in Euler dynamics was considered to be purely kinematical thing, which uh, is something which never changes. Now we suddenly see that in thermodynamics, if you actually consider thermodynamics, 
you'll find out this gamma is fluctuating. It produce, provides the soft mode, and that soft mode is, is really what uh, is responsible for the, uh, this uh, multifractal uh, uh, scaling. Because this, I'm not, cannot prove that it is exactly quadra parabola, exactly parabola, but the degrees of freedom which could create at, at, at zero temperature, because effective temperature goes to zero in that uh, effective, uh, effective statistical give distribution, you have only soft modes which are contributing. If any mode with a gap disappears in a zero temperature limit, and effective temperature goes to zero as Reynolds to one third, the minus one third. So we find that actual normal thermal fluctuations are suddenly very strong because of this massless zero modes. And because of that, we have uh, multifractal scaling. And if you consider topological solutions for those same uh, 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 field gamma, uh, which is responsible for zero mode, these topological solutions <clears throat> are explaining your exponential decrease. So we have very simple, very explicit theory, which is basically a theory of massless field, the dimensional massless field on a uh, dynamical surface. And surface is more or less frozen because we are considering low temperature. So it looks like uh, we've, we've found, or at least conjecture, uh, the relevant degrees of freedom which are responsible for turbulent fluctuations. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, very helpful. Um, just wonder if there are any other questions uh, for Sasha. I would like, is, is Nigel Goldenfield here? Let me check. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hi, Sasha. Oh, because I'm very excited about the analogy with your work. Uh, yeah, me too. Just today, after we talked, I looked yeah. at my formulas and found out that my uh, behavior of effective temperature exactly matches your best fit yeah. to our law. Exactly. That, 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 that's, that's why when, when I sent you my email like a couple of weeks ago and then, and then you lost and then we sent it and so on. I didn't yeah, exactly. realize it just I think, I think it's today. I think it's, I think it's fantastic, yes. And could you tell us what were your motivation, what were your physics idea uh, of why uh, the turbulence is, could be equivalent to the uh, low temperature yeah. XY model? But that's so, a lot of motivation. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. So there was there was a a paper that was uh, published in Nature um, about twenty years ago uh, by uh, um, Bramwell um, uh, um, and uh, uh, Holdsworth and Pan Jean François Fortin uh, and BHP. And uh, what they they what looked at the power in 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 a, in a geometry called a French washing machine where you have two counter rotating discs. And they asked, if I keep the disc rotating at a constant uh, angular velocity, what is the power that is needed to keep them doing this? And of course, the drag fluctuates, and so the power fluctuates. And so they measured the probability uh, density of the power fluctuations. And what they noticed was that this matched exactly the magnetization fluctuations in the uh, 2D uh, XY model and spin wave approximation. And so this was a big mystery. Actually, it, my paper, as far as I know, is the only one that tried to uh, explain this. And so what I, uh, I guess that, uh, that you would have a sort of sheer pancake. And uh, I didn't, of course, know Sasha's arguments about why you would get a Gibbs distribution, but I guessed that he would get a Gibbs distribution. And then I, I asked myself, how would I work out what the effective temperature is of that Gibbs distribution? And so I worked it out on the paper and you have to read it at a PRL in 2000 or something like that. And, uh, and, I got, and, and it's the formula that, that he, 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 was, he was showing. And I, I, tried, I, I extracted it from the data. And, um, and, 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 and my argument was a sort of dimension counting argument. I didn't know all the things that, that Sasha has talked about. So I was just, what I assumed was that the shear pancake was fluctuating. And that what you're looking at were the amplitude fluctuations. Not, not the, so those are the zero modes, not the ones that he, that he was talking about. And uh, so I got, I got a formula for, the, for that effective temperature. And of course, if you do it with the mode that Sasha's talking about, you get a slightly different answer. And it looks like it's the one that- Yeah, you got one quarter and I got one third. That's correct. And, if, and, and as I noted, even in my email to you, um, um, it was um, it, 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 in the paper, I noted it didn't quite fit my formula. I didn't, know, I didn't know the reason why, but now 20 years later, thanks to Sasha, we uh, may indeed have an explanation for that. So it's, it's very, Good. it's very cool. It's great. Yeah. Any other uh, comment on Sasha's talk? 
Yeah, I, I would like to understand uh, a couple of things, which I, I uh, so in in these X Y models. So you're you're talking about two dimensional X Y models or three dimensional X Y models on on surfaces that these random surfaces. Is that correct? I am not uh, inventing a models or hypothesizing. Uh, I derive this. Uh, 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 viscosity anomaly, and it appears to be similar to the XY model. A, a three dimensional I derive XY it from model first on, on a random I take a or... limit of zero viscosity in Navier Stokes equation, and I find out extra term which was lost. And this term is a limit of new times, uh, 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 new times omega squared in the limit of zero viscosity. And that term is gradient gamma squared. Tom wants to know whether it corresponds to 2D XY model or 3D XY model. It's 2D. No, it is 2D. It is on the surface. Okay. In, in, okay. in, my, in, in my argument, it was uh, you had a shear pancake, and then what you looked at was the projection of the normal vectors down onto the onto the plane of the shear pancake, and, and so that's how I that's how I guessed it was a 2D XY model. So it is not exactly XY model because I don't have this rotational symmetry. XY yeah. model is something which is too far. Uh, has a U1 symmetry. Yeah. Up here. That I don't have here, but I don't think okay. that is needed because all we really need, we don't need that extra uh, periodicity. All we really need is a, a, a scalar field in one dimension that would produce proper thermodynamics, which, which would uh, uh, explain this phenomena, which was uh, studied by those experimentalists. Okay, very good. Right. And now you also you also mentioned this uh, this Liouville theory, uh, which has multifactorial exponents, at, at least a, a, as a, as a model for uh, for for low moments or something like that. Correct. Yes. Yes. So if you have um, the the so is there are there corrections that you can financial of of this it's, it's so called Liouville field, uh, which is hidden yeah. degree of freedom on a surface. So yeah. what is proportional exponential of the Liouville field because of a metric tensor. And a Liouville field is a Gaussian two-dimensional field. So if you compute this functional integral, you will get parabolic uh, shape of this zeta of n. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with that. Uh, so so you're, you're, you're saying that this is, this is gonna be reasonably accurate in some, in some range of, of, uh, uh, of parameters? I, cannot, I don't quite, didn't I quite understand where it was. I am just giving that as a hint because uh, my uh, Hamiltonian is more complex. In addition to this massless uh, uh, field on the surface, there is three-dimensional massless field interacting with that one. If you integrate out this three-dimensional massless field, you will get Coulomb interact non-local Coulomb interaction for the two-dimensional field. So, I don't know how to solve such a theory where there are two fields, one in two dimensional, another in three dimensional. If I just throw away three dimensional part and only do the uh, two dimensional, if I integrate, just eliminate, uh, forget about three dimensional field, then I'll have free field on a surface and that field will generate through conformal anomaly, it will generate Liouville field and that will give uh, the uh, 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 parabolic zeta. So it's only, it's model approximation. Unlike other things which I claim are exact formulas, this is not exact formula. Okay, okay. No, thanks. Anybody else? So if not, maybe we should uh, call it a day. Um, I want to thank uh, Tom Spencer, who is always uh, very generous with uh, any suggestions uh, I make personally. And uh, this was a suggestion that came from uh, such an middle, and I asked Tom, and he was very generous in making it happen. And also, well, I want to thank you, uh, Srini, and and all the and uh, Sasha and, and and Gregory too for the very inspiring and uh, uh, interesting talks. It's uh, I, I, of course I only understood a small, a small fraction, but uh, but it really uh, it it really starts to makes you think about different things that maybe you haven't thought about before. And that's that's. Uh, Tom, if you see Michelle, will you give her my thanks for all? I will this? certainly do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank okay, you. Thank you all very thank much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you for all the talks. Thank, thank you, Nigel. And